I gotta put these in today. What are those? This is lace wing eggs. Oh yes. I love that is my favorite beneficial insect. Aren't they terrifying looking though? Oh I love them. They're so terrifying okay. looking. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. So I'm at Kingbird Farm and it is the middle of winter, but we're here to see Karma's plants in her conservatory, which I could actually see some here and through the reflection. It's a tiny conservatory, but she fits a lot of plants in it and she's gonna take us through that. So let's go see it. So I just walked inside to uh, Karma's little seed starting and propagation vicinity right here, right? Vicinity, it looks like you yes. have like a nice collection, but you said this is not gonna be, it's not full right now. No, so I actually start seed starting pretty late in the season. If you talk to a lot of other like bedding plant growers and stuff, they will have started a couple of months ago at least. But I start really late for a couple of reasons. One is because I don't want to turn my greenhouse on until the very last. I'm, I'm very adverse to using yeah. uh, too much propane yeah. or, you know, you know, wasting heat. Um, and my big greenhouse, well, it is very efficient. It is very large. Right. And so if I start it in weather like this, then I'm going to be using a lot more. So I start really late, which means my plants are always later than everybody else's at Farmer's Market. Right. Um, but it, it has worked well for me um, and has been more economically sound for me. So I've just started a few things so far. Uh, and then as, as I transplant out all of these light benches, I'll have to give up all the other reasons I'm using them, but uh, <laughs> For storage. all these light benches <laughs> will be full. So I start in, in channel trays primarily. Interesting, okay, and what are you growing here? Well, these, are, these some, are herbs. These are some slower growing herbs. Yep. And I use channel trays because I do so many varieties, but I do very small amounts of everything. I'm not, I'm not a very big grower, so I'll probably yeah. maybe only do, you know, 25 to 50 of each kind of plant, which right. isn't very many, but I'm doing a, a vast variety of varieties, a variety of varieties. <laughs> um, so the channel trays are good for that. I can get a lot of things started in a compact space, and then as, I can transplant them out into plug trays later on. So these are primarily herbs and I primarily use channel trays for that. Um, and do you find like the people who buy your herbs will tend to buy a vast majority of them? Like they, they want the variety or they come in and they just say, I, w I just want time. No, it's usually a variety. Okay. Yeah, I think I have like 40 varieties of herbs, which isn't a ton, but. Yeah, but that's um, a, for a small grower, that's yeah. quite substantial. And then I also do tomatoes and peppers. So right. herbs, tomatoes, and peppers are my three biggest production. Peppers and tomatoes won't get started till next month. Right. Um, and then things like uh, slow growing succulents and things like that, I am growing in pots starting in pots. Wow. So like these little anacampsarosa yeah. up, we got stapelias, these hoodies came up. So these are... They look so cute as, like, I they look like little guys with like their I hands know. up and like I a cloak. Them. Right. There's nothing more exciting than watching succulents come up. Oh, that's so fun. Um, and I grow these in pots because these guys are going to remain in place for a long time. Yeah, so, like how long are you gonna be, like for this to be sold afterwards? I mean, this could be two this years This probably maybe. won't be this year, yeah. right, right. The anacampsaros and some other things will grow fast enough that I'll sell them this year. Yeah. But they'll remain in these pots um, for several months and so and they don't like to be transplanted that much So unlike the herbs where they're gonna grow fast enough that they're gonna come out of the channel trays and get potted on several times before they're sold These are gonna remain in these pots for several months while they get big enough to be handleable that I can transplant them on for sale So how, that's how why do you, I do bigger pots. How do you make the decisions like being a small grower and you said that you're actually gonna be moving more of your production towards plants rather yeah. than you know poultry and birds and stuff like that so how do you make a decision with the smaller amount of growing space what you want to commit the growing space to especially when you have something like slow growing succulents compared to a little bit more fast growing as far as the herbs go yeah that's a really good point because um at this point in my production i am still using these these light benches and therefore I do have to prioritize space 
and the value of the plants is definitely highest in things like the tomatoes and peppers mm -hmm. um, because I know I'm going to sell all of them this season. Like right. they're all going to find a home immediately. They don't take that long to grow. They won't going to stick around in the greenhouse very long. So yeah, as far as economically, these things make a lot more sense to prioritize. Yeah. But I don't always make much sense. And <laughs> these are what I prefer to grow. So those are like my bread and butter, right? Yeah. And then when it comes down to the weird shit, that's what I like to <laughs> yeah. grow. Yeah. And some of this stuff I may have in my greenhouse for two or three years, like the aloe that you got from yeah, me. Yeah, which you know, is I'd, amazing. I'd already had that for a couple of years. Do you ever, and, do you ever like cry from parting with a plant that oh, you've grown for so long. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely I do. And sometimes oh. if it doesn't go for a while and I'm yeah. still in love with it, I'm like fine, I'm keeping that. <laughs> um, so I get, yeah, I, I mean get you. that those there there there's got to be a balance like with anything on our farm. There's a balance between things that we like super want to do even though they don't make a lot of economic sense sometimes yeah. and that stuff that we still love to do and is more economically profitable and I balance those two. Mm -hmm. So you've always you've always got some things propping up other things mm -hmm. a little bit, Yeah. Um, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, but right now, um, since I'm still working here, I will have to keep growing those more popular things to manage to grow these other things. I, I suspect as we increase plant production, we will be putting in a greenhouse that we start early in the season. Yeah, well, so especially that, if you're going to start investing yeah. more into that space and yeah. you want to move the production towards that. So I'll, we'll be putting in a small propagation greenhouse, mm -hmm. something that is not, you know, I mean, the, the big propagation greenhouse is huge. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to start that first thing in the season. Mm -hmm. But if we can put in a small one that I can heat early in the season instead of using light benches, mm -hmm. then uh, that's probably the next step. Yeah. And then are there anything that you're growing this year that you may have not grown in a while or you haven't grown yet and you're just kind of trying it out and testing There's it out? There's always new things. I do that every year. I mean, um, you have a lot of seeds right here, so it's like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm like always I'm always catalog. I'm always trying some new succulents to see what will grow for me mm -hmm. um, and see what are worth you know putting the time into growing from seed things like anacampsaros which mm -hmm. we'll see some some starts in the conservatory that are already of fairly large size they're easy to grow from seed I produce my own seed they grow enough in one season to be saleable that's a really good one to do. So I'll always do that. And then I'll add in some new ones, like the hoodias. I've never mm -hmm. grown hoodia before, mm -hmm. but I really like things in the stipelid group, um, and they sell really well. So if I can do a few of those from seed and maybe make my own seed in the future, then, then it'll be worthwhile. So I'm always dabbling with some just yeah. to see. I, it's also, so nice to see these seedlings. I can't get over the fact that they look like <laughs> little dudes, you know? <laughs> little dudes. I know, and I love also there's like I do... Um, I like how when you can see what they're going to look like early on. Yeah. And, and how do you decide? You have different potting mediums here, so I'd, I'd be curious like to see what you're kind of growing. Aloes. Oh my god, little aloe feroxes. Yeah, little pachypodiums. Oh my goodness, they look like little sunflowers almost. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. No, you're right, yeah. that's a really good yeah. point. Um, so funny. I try, if, I always do things in a few different methods to see what's going to work for me the first year. Yeah. Um, so what what's going on with these guys is that there is a layer of pot, regular potting mix mm -hmm. Uh, with grit in the bottom. And then the top is more just uh, peat moss and grit. Yeah. So there's less likely to have problems with damping off and things like that. Yeah. So I try to sort of s a semi sterile mix at the top. It's not yeah. really, none of, nothing I do is ever sterile. Yeah. But a semi sterile mix at the top with the richer potting mix at the bottom. Okay. So it, you know, the plant, when it's germinating, it doesn't need all that nutrients. Right. And you're less it like. It has all the nutrients in the seed. In the seed. Right. Yeah. And then as it grows, it's going to send those roots down mm -hmm. into the potting mix mm -hmm. that has nutrients in mm -hmm. it when it actually needs it. Um, so that way um, I can try to avoid damping off and get better germination in a less intense soil, but then have soil underneath. Yeah. And then you have some heating mats under here too, right? Because that will, will help. So you get the, the heat probably from the light, right? Right. So there's a combination of the heat from the, from the grow lights yeah. and the, the mats. Um, and earlier, before these things had germinated, I also kept the plastic domes on them. Mm -hmm. um, I only do that in the very beginning, because once things are up, uh, I take the domes off so that we don't get any rot or mold. Right. right. And that's hard when you're doing a vast variety of things like this, because... They're coming up at different oh times. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. so irritating. So, yeah. so I you know, have to juggle that a little bit. But that's the price I pay for being such a small grower. Yeah. I'm never going to have a whole flat of one thing. Yeah. I mean, look that's how fine... A, the Aristolochias are. 
They're just like so little fimbriatus. Delicate. Yeah. That's a, and that's a seed I grow myself. So it's a, there's a combination in here of seeds I grow myself and seeds that I purchase. I'm a member of the the Cactus and Succulent Society. Oh, nice. So they have a lot of seeds Is there available. like a local chapter here in New York? There or? isn't that okay. I know of. Not in, at least yeah. in my area. There's probably yeah. a New York City one. Yeah. Um, and then my daughter is, is a member of NARGS, yeah. which is the, the Rock Garden Society, yeah. which does have a local chapter. Yeah. So we get a lot of seeds from them. I mean, we get a lot of really interesting oh, seeds. Fun. It's just um, like almost too many to plant. Oh my gosh, well this is Rosie's. Goodness. This is all of Rosie's work. In fact, she just got in the mail yesterday all of these rock garden plants. Oh my gosh. And this is her job. So these are these are generally rarer plants. Are they more like succulents? Like a succulent rock garden? Or are Not they so kind much. of like yeah, okay. Not so much. So more alpine mix. things. And so it's is it something that you could grow out here or is it more like you're growing in a travertine kind of thing? She specialty? everything that Rosie grows, she grows as hardy. Or okay. or purportedly hardy and then she tries it here in the Arctic right. to see. <laughs> Um, yeah, you should come back this like summer because her rock garden is absolutely spectacular. I would love to. I would love to see it because a rock garden is probably something that is super feasible where we are mm -hmm. because there have been a ton of gravel that has been brought oh, in. Nice, so it's all well drained. It's can... super well drained. They put in a bunch of tile drainage and I'm trying to like potentially grow back some meadow in those areas, but then some of it I think will be great just as like rocky outcrop rock gardens mm. really intense light so we figured you know we might as well move towards that as some yeah of the yeah let 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 the landscape dictate what you do yeah, with it exactly. I think that's a good idea exactly yeah, yeah. so then, she'll grow a whole bunch of that stuff and then whatever's left over i'll sell that's great that's kind of how it works <laughs> there's also another nursery um that i like to get some rock plants from i don't know if you're familiar with them they're in virginia called rare roots no, I'm not. Yeah, Rosie you, probably is. But yeah, I, it's not. There, there's some interesting things, but if you had that equivalent up here, that would be kind of cool. So, do you think that she would maybe try to establish some of those and have it be sold through your operation, or do you think this is just her, something that she's experimenting with? Um, it could go further than that as mm -hmm. I expand. If mm -hmm. it if it appears that like rock garden and alpine plants are popular in this area, yeah. it's possible. But I really want to be focused on only selling locally. I'm not interested in doing mail order, and I'm not interested in going out and doing a lot of shows. A lot right. of rock garden people go out and do shows mm -hmm. uh, to sell at. Um, so I really want to stay local, which means I can do some of this stuff. Yeah. But I don't know how much I can expand and be realistic about how many sales I'm actually yeah. going to have if I'm going to stay local like well, that. It so, seems like you're being realistic to like what's true to what feels right for you, what feels true to you at this point in time. You like your plants. You want to experiment. You have like contended with the fact that you like to have a variety. <laughs> so I think you just like really know yourself, which is like good on you. <laughs> well, I got I don't want to overproduce and not, not have any way to sell them. Yeah. Um, and I also generally don't sell anything I won't grow myself mm -hmm. because I can't throw plants away. Yeah. So anything that's left over, I'm going to put in our gardens mm -hmm. or I'm going to, you know, extra tomato plants I'm going to grow out. You know, yeah. if I've got a hundred or something left, I cannot throw it away. I just cannot. <laughs> do it. So I'll either donate it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've done a lot of that or we'll grow it here. Yeah. Yeah, so, and well, I also, especially when you grow them from seed, it makes a difference, right? Yeah, so yeah, I have gave them a lot of resource. And this is my very favorite stuff right here. So these are cuttings. Ooh. So these are passion flower cuttings. Oh, you and your passion flowers. Yeah. Right? You said you're really big into them. How I many am. different varieties do you have? Or well, I have 25, yeah. uh, but I don't necessarily manage to propagate all of them successfully mm -hmm. for sale. Mm. Um, some propagate a lot easier than others. Some I grow from seed. Like yeah. you can see this, this is Passiflora fetida. It germinates oh, really wow. well. Yeah. I always have that for sale from seed because yeah. it, and look at everybody else. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and do, you ever, do you ever like uh, try to tweak your way of propagation year over year? Absolutely. Just yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like the, usually for the last 10 years, I've just been propagating passion flowers in moist perlite. Yeah. Um, and this year I've tried uh, doing it in soil. So it's got a similar setup where the bottom. All perlite, huh? Yeah, that's what I wow, used to do. interesting. Which worked really well, but yeah. it also meant that you had to make sure you were keeping it moist all, all the, time the time and dry okay. out super fast. Yeah. And also the roots weren't that strong. Yeah. So when we'd take them out to transplant them into soil, the difference going from the perlite to the soil, I could lose plants that mm. way. The roots would break off yeah. or they just wouldn't adapt well to soil. Have, have you ever tried vermiculate over perlite? I haven't. And that's 
primarily because I have a lifetime supply of perlite. Oh, okay. <laughs> we bought out a, a, a gardener that was going out of business, so yeah. I have perlite for the rest of my life. Oh, my goodness. And so I can't imagine buying any other medium. <laughs> I just, I, I had read some studies that, um, that uh, vermiculite has a better aeration for the roots and is easier to go from vermiculite mm -hmm. to soil than it is to from perlite to soil, and the germination rates are higher in all vermiculite versus all perlite. That, I, I could see yeah. that. Yeah. But, but since you have a lifetime supply, you might as well. Yeah. Uh, well, might I'm well trying the it. soil this year, so yeah. we'll see. So like it's again that there's there's potting mix in the bottom, and then the top is just coir and perlite. Yeah. So that it's you know sort of semi. Also, oh, you're using coconut coir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So when I make my own potting mix, yeah. the base is not peat moss; it okay. is coir. Okay. Interesting. When did you switch over to that, or how, have you been using it all the time? We, yeah, we, we've made our own potting mix all along because we have so much compost. Yeah. I always felt like bringing in a large amount of fertility didn't make any sense yeah. at all since yeah. we have so much fertility. Um, and I was using peat moss in the beginning, and then I started doing some research into my inputs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, greenhouse inputs are pretty intense shit, yeah. as you know. And, um, and peat moss being one of them mm -hmm. and being mined and um, n definitely not sustainable yeah. because it takes so long to develop. So I started looking into alternatives for the bulking agent. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it I use is compost, but I still need something that it, that's a little bit more Airy. aerated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and what I found was that coconut coir, even though it comes from Indonesia, um, since it is shipped and it is a byproduct, mm -hmm. it has a much lower carbon footprint than peat moss that's mm -hmm. being trucked down from yeah. Canada. And that surprised me yeah. because it's coming on the slow boat from yeah. Asia. I'm yeah. like, what? But because it's coming on boats and because it's already a byproduct um, that it is. And I, you know, again, all, what also happened was me buying out this garden center mm -hmm. and these totes of not only coir, but perlite and mm -hmm. some peat moss, which I have a lot of as well because I bought them out. Yeah. So I bought all this stuff secondhand, yeah. which I can now use forever and ever. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm balanced between buying things that I find are more sustainable and then using up all this stuff that exactly. I have. So there's, I'm just finding this balance. And yeah. I do the same with pots. Um, I don't buy any plastic at all. Yeah, I, I think the aloe that I got from you is planted in this little like glass pot with mm -hmm. a, a hole that you yeah. drilled in the bottom. Yeah, and then <laughs> for the for any of the starting, this is all secondhand stuff. Yeah. I never buy any plastic. Um, when I sell off all the tomatoes and peppers and herbs, they're all in fiber pots that yep. are compostable. Mm -hmm. And then with the house plants, they're either in recycled plastic pots or in the in well all the thrifted pots. That yeah. Are, and then one more question on the coconut choir is, I know sometimes that the coconuts could come, depending on where it's coming from, whether it's like seaside or not, it could be a little bit salty. Do you wash the coir before you actually use it and mix it into your own mix? Yeah, high salinity can be a problem. Yeah. And so different producers um, are better at that. You, yeah. know, you have to know who you're getting it from. And I also do rinse it. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of times I'll find sand in it as well, yeah. and that's when you'll know, you're like, wait a minute, this yeah. has probably got a little more salinity. Yeah. So that is an issue I have run into, yeah. but it all gets soaked, and then the water gets drained off. Very good. Okay. And then it looks like you also have some cuttings up on top here. Yeah, a little bit. Here we go, yeah. This was me trying... Um, it looks like the best birthday cake one could get. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a sheet cake. Right, right. You know? <laughs> Look at that, wow. So this is completely unorganized, as you can see. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's somewhat, it's somewhat organized, I see. I so see I do a combination of tip cuttings yeah. and just leaves. Yeah. Um, this looks so Dr. Seussish, doesn't it? Or Seussish, or like, you know, also something like that you'd, you, the crassula that would be yeah, that's, the, the that's bottom of the that sea. That variety is golem. Yeah, golem, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I do a little bit in the winter, and mainly this is just stuff from prunings and trimmings right. as I'm managing the greenhouse. Yeah. And then in the summer, when I move into the main greenhouse, then I'll start, you know, like actually wholesale harvesting from my mother plants yeah. and starting to propagate. Because I can start now, but I'm not really going to get a jump on anything right. because they're not going to do it's, much They're for just so kind long. of like in stasis. Yeah. yeah. So I always keep some propagation trays going yeah. for cuttings like this or things yeah. that fall off. Because you don't want to throw them away, right? No, no. So, yeah. yeah, but really it's going to take so long for them to do much. Yeah. It doesn't behoove me to start a lot of succulents right now. Yeah. Unless I use a lot, I mean, I could use a lot of my light benches and yep. bottom heat mm -hmm. to do that. Um, but I find just waiting until we're in a nice, big, sunny greenhouse is right. just as effective. Right. Well, should we look at your conservatory? That sounds like a plan. Yeah. <laughs> 
You'll have to take us through some of your plant collection afterwards too, your personal plant collection. Oh, well, <laughs> there's a few. Just like there's pet chickens, there's pet plants yes, too. There Absolutely, because this really is a working collection. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times the plants get harvested off rather aggressively. So yeah. there's a few I like to just leave into their magnificence and not harvest off of. So how long have you had most of these plants, or are they do they come um, into your collection now and again? And I would say I started the vast majority of the collection in like 2016. Yeah. Um, where I was like actively putting together collection that I could propagate off of. Yeah. Um, so because I'm a certified organic grower, um, I want to bring a plant into my collection and manage it organically mm -hmm. before I start, you know, selling off of mm -hmm. it. Uh, so I really actively for a couple of years was collecting plants that I wanted to propagate off of. And some are not successful. Like there, right. there are plants in my collection that just have never... Uh, they either don't propagate easily or they don't grow fast enough to right. harvest off of. So some things have just remained in the collection for fun. And some of them I have gotten, you know, hundreds of plants off over yeah. the years. Is so. this a Natal plum? It is. Yeah, this it is, is a beautiful growth structure too. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. Well, it was it was it was sitting outside on the deck all summer, <laughs> and it just got a wonderful cascade to it. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I'm not pruning that. Yeah. So tell me about this because you cram this, you know, uh, conservatory up. It's not a, it's not a big conservatory. How no, big is it? It's 16 by 10. Okay, 16 by 10. Okay, this gives me a really good <laughs> sense about if I were to you know build a conservatory. I feel like, is this too small? Um, but you you bring these in from the summer months and you. You put them in here. How do you do it? I mean, especially as they start to grow, do you start to clip them back? Like, what do you? What's your strategy? <laughs> yeah, strategy. You, you act like I have one. Um, <laughs> no, it is challenging. I do move most things out of here for the summer. Mm -hmm. um, one to clean it out, and two, you know, I like the plants to get weathered. Yeah, it really is helpful for for pest pressure or for just you know they need to be, you know rained on they need yeah. wind it's much better for their they development they get too lightweight they, sometimes they really right? do so you know, i pull them all out they in the harden summer. off outside and then as it got too cold um i started pulling things in i cut them back pretty aggressively before i bring them in um which is unfortunate because that's not a good time to take cuttings but <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and a lot of things don't get to come here anything that goes dormant yeah is actually in our walk-in cooler yeah so we have smelling a, your leaves, by the way. Oh my god! Oh my god! Lemon drops. Yeah, that one's and this one's. This one's more rosy. This is like. What is this? Me, oh, this is more. This is supposed to be a peppermint one. Is it? Oh yeah. Okay, there you go. peppermint. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the passion flowers all go upstairs in my studio. They're hmm. actually upstairs in the house. Okay. Um, and they're just kind of hanging. I don't want them to grow much over the winter. Yeah. Because if you can imagine, like twenty passion, big <laughs> passion flowers. They get all vine all over the place. I don't want them growing that much yeah. in the winter. I want yeah. them to just chill. Um, and then the things that end up in here are the things that um, are more light sensitive, they, mm -hmm. they need good light, and they need to stay fairly warm over the winter. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to grow, but I, I, I want them to stay relatively healthy. I still get a little cold damage in mm -hmm. here. Um, I try to keep it about 55. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that, and that's a little cool for some of the leafy tropicals, but the succulents do really well. Um, so well, l take me through some of the ones that you have, or that have been like with you for a while, or that might be new ones and, um, or, or ones that you, uh, sell a lot of, or, you know, I'd, I'd love yeah. if you just take us through some There's of the. There's a few like, um. And this is a Portulacaria afra. Yeah, this is a, a it's a, it's it's like a weeping one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has a really good shape, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. So I got this one as a fairly small plant. Um, and you can always tell all my plants are labeled. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Portulacaria afra. Elephant I got it from bush. Baker's Acres oh, that's nice. in 2015. Um, and then I also have a database where yeah. everything is kept. Um, like a spreadsheet. So, mm -hmm, yeah, exactly. Okay. You're a little nerdy. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this one is a really great plant for me because it grows really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, I can harvest off of it, take lots of cuttings, and do that rather aggressively, and yet it still remains a nice looking plant. What would be a typical cutting? Like, do you put like a, a couple stems when you, you know, are trying to, like when you try to sell it after, like, 
is it just one little cutting, or how do you sell? Generally, them? like I mean, with with Portulacaria afra, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I can pop one of these off. I might need it. clippers. Yeah. Um, but I would start a cutting about this mm -hmm. size, mm -hmm. and so even after just putting down some roots and getting established, it's already big enough to be quote unquote saleable. Yeah. Um, but it'll be more interesting after a full season when you can when you prune it and put it into an interesting sort of bonsai yeah. type shape. Yeah. The beauty of Portugal Caras are that you can prune them into bonsai shapes mm -hmm. and get lots of interesting forms and they grow really, really fast. Mm -hmm. So it's a great balance between, you know, uh, you can manipulate it, and yet it's going to give you instantaneous yeah. rewards, pretty much. It's like, <laughs> so that's a really great plant for me, and I've had that one a while. Um, this is the one I was talking about um, that I was propagating in here. Yes, this is Anacampsaros. Yeah. This is Anacampsaros telefiastrum, which is the telefiastrum is nice because it has this beautiful pink underneath, mm. and people really love pink, especially college girls. Does that, uh, does that actually um, get pinker in the sunlight or does it just have that natural? It color? always has that naturally, yeah. Okay. And you can see it's not getting a, a ton of a sunlight right now, but yeah. it has really good color. Speaking um, I, of college girls, you can, it looks like little Colin Coey pink butterflies That there. is pink butterflies, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I would say like 90% of mm -hmm. my customer base mm -hmm. are college students. Really? Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. Oh my God, they're so cute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What, what are these back here? Oh, So wow. those are 2018 from Seed. So oh, they're still goodness. very, very very small. Wow. 2018. I have to appreciate that. <laughs> and they're in their dormant stage. It looks yeah. like we might lose that one. But yeah. in their this stage, you know, they're building the new leaves by sucking off of the old leaves. Yep. I find these and lithops and some of those other plants to be really, really hard to grow. Mm -hmm. People love them. They always want lithops. And I'm like, buy them from Altman plants. <laughs> I, you know, they're, they're so high maintenance. You really need to have a system and a facility just for those plants. Right. And I haven't found that they integrate well into everything else I'm doing. So yeah. I generally will abandon a variety of plants that just doesn't work with my system. And yeah, it, yeah it would be really effing popular if I had them, <laughs> but it's too much work. And especially in my situation where I don't have like major climate controlled greenhouses right. and I just have to pick the ones that really work well for me. I like I like this growth structure as well. Yeah, I These love are, those. Yeah. I have I have a bit of a ripsilis issue. I love oh, ripsilis of yeah, all kinds, me too. especially when they're in bloom like this. Yeah, mine mine. I just noticed my pentapatera actually started to bloom, and they started getting like really nice fleshy yeah fleshy uh, bits on them. And look at oh, there's one. Yeah, I mean, plants like that do really well for me because I can harvest a lot of propagation material yeah. off them, um, and so they kind of pay for themselves. And I've tried to find a balance between the plants that pay for themselves and the plants that are just here for fun. Mm -hmm. So those are definitely, I'd say, all the crassulas, the calanchoes, mm -hmm. all super easy to propagate. Very giving. Grow very fast. Yeah. People love them. I can sell them cheap um, because they propagate so easily. That's another good one. Um, I got some fuzzier ones oh, up yeah, here, okay. and then um, this yep. is Tubiflora. Do you usually dig Ramontiana? Oh, he's, he's, he's flowering. Yeah, right. right. You see that? I do a lot of Tubiflora and dig yeah. and pink butterflies because they produce so many, you There's know, another plantlets. Colin Coy, Rambo Pelosa, I think that's one. I love that coloration on that. That one's a bugger, though. It, see, it breaks very easily. It breaks. Yeah. Yeah, the ones, things grows, like, grows. another one that's really popular with customers mm -hmm. are, like, Sedum Morganianum. Oh, yeah, the burrows, the burrows tail. tails, yeah. But I can't take that to market. No, they just break. They just fall <laughs> apart. I know. So sometimes I'll sell them just in the farm store because the they don't get carpa. moved around. Yeah, that's a good one, huh? The, he probably just flowered, right? Mine was just flowering, yeah. yeah. It did, you're right. Yeah. Oh, here's a... The seropegia yeah. is Rapunzel, Rapunzel. Let's flower, flowered and produced seed. Ooh, that is so cool to see the seed. Yeah, that's the seed <gasps> pod, which is about to blow, so I have to keep oh, an eye on it. Oh, my goodness. So I usually let them ripen on the plant yeah. and then try to get them right before they open up or I'll lose that's the seeds. That's cool. I grew a lot of seropegia yeah. from, from seed last year, and I wasn't sure because you can yeah. also grow them from cuttings. Yeah, look at that. You could just look at how many they're producing. I could, but my mother plant yeah. is not that big. Yeah, but it produced a lot of seed last year, and I'm like, well, wow. let's try it. And they grew enough in one season that they were worth it. Yeah, it was wow. really nice. Good you just you. never know. <laughs> you oh, just look never how know. Fleshy. 
is this the type of peperomia? That's uh, uh, deep, deep piana. I think that's deep piana. Or something so like that, that is what h half of what um, peperomia hope. Oh yeah, so it's peperomia yep. hope. Yep. Yeah, because it's like dipiana and then quadrifolium or something is. Uh, that's yeah, that's beautiful. a good one. This one propagates fairly well because yeah. it'll propagate at each node. Yeah. And, and that one's been, I've, you can see I've, I've used it's, it a fair bit. <laughs> it's nice and thick and fleshy, though. Yeah. It looks like you do put that one outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they all go out. I really like to do um, crassulas, and I really like to do echeverias, and mm -hmm. I really like to do aloes. All three of those I find really Which easy I to propagate. I love aloes. The echeverias, most of the big this echeverias is are in the house. by seed? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so nice. So nice. And I can do them by seed and I'll have a small plant the first season. Mm -hmm. I'd really prefer to do pups, of mm -hmm. course. Like this one, it, this one's not that old and it is pupping already. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah, that is really so nice. So this is a much quicker way to get baby aloes than to do it by seed. And look at this one that you could just kind of clip along this one right here, right? Yeah, I haven't tried to propagate that one yet. Huh. That's one of my pets. Yeah, is that one of your pets? <laughs> <laughs> that one is... Oh, it's an, alo an aloanopsis. Oh, so it's recently been probably put into a new genus. Because a lot of aloes, I mean, a lot of plants get blown up and put into oh a new gosh. genus. Oh my Rosie is constantly updating yeah. for me. Yeah. She keeps up on the, I mean, you know, she's like, she being the botanist, she yeah. keeps up on the changes and she'll have me change things all the time. <laughs> and and you're like, no, like, I'm not, I, I just learned it as And this. honestly, I'm not sure my customers, some customers yeah. really care and some customers don't. Is this a wolf, wolf gang? Gii crania peperomia, do you know? Or is this a... Oh, I love that, I love peperomia. No, Dulliberformis. See, the Dulliberformis, they have so many different sh forms of mm -hmm. Dulliberformis. I think that's the, only, that's the only one I have. Yeah. And it propagates okay, but I've never gotten a big enough plant to yeah. make it really worthwhile. Yeah, the ferrarays actually I think are more, uh, they, they grow a bit better. So another thing that I do is I'll get one? rid of a big one. That's yeah. the one from seed too. I don't Alice know what it is. No. Species. Oh, I was saying with that, uh, fairy eye, um, a lot of times uh, at some point the mm -hmm. mother plant will become just too big and onerous yeah, to deal with. Yeah, it kind of gets like... So I'll end up oh. taking a cutting and then selling off the mother plant. Oh, okay. And just keep, because of the space yeah. issues. So if it's a, you know, if it's something like a crassula where I know I'm gonna get tons of babies off it, yeah. it's worth keeping a really big plant. Yeah. But a lot of times I'll sell off the really big plant right. and keep a smaller plant for the season just so I can keep it in the collection, mm -hmm. but not necessarily have a big one. I do that with passion flowers too. Mm -hmm. Eventually I'll have a mother plant that's just so freaking enormous. I'm yeah. like, I, I can't can't haul you around anymore. I'll sell that giant mother plant to someone that maybe only has two, yeah. right, you know? And and I'll do a cutting and start a new mother plant. I do that a lot just to maintain space Well, reality. I noticed you have some like Horthiopsis, Horthias, and some Gasteria, which are more compact, I kind of feel, right? Mm -hmm. You have some back here, so maybe that's oh, and also- and Gaster good... Aloes, gosh, do I love Gaster Oh, Gaster Aloes, aloes Green oh. Ice is like There's one Green of my Ice favorite. right there. Oh yeah, there it is. Well, yours is really icy looking. I love that plant. Yeah, that yeah. is so attractive. And it's been pupping pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, and it's nice with those guys. You can't grow those from seed, right? Because no, it's a- it's a hybrid. It's a genus, yeah, it's a cross of the genus. Although if you ask Rosie, they're now saying that they're in the same genus, but whatever. Oh. Yeah, don't, don't get her started. Yeah, well, you and know. And then they'll change it, so. Yeah, well, you should try <laughs> from seed then. Or maybe it doesn't- does It, it hasn't flowered yet. Okay. Not for me. Okay. Some of what's them flowered. That, what's that long one right there, over there? The, this is the same as yours. Is it really? Mm -hmm. It just looks so much more mature. Oh, It's the same planting. It's, it's the so same beautiful. planting as yours. It's just yeah, got well, a weirder you know, shape. They start, yeah, they start young. They start like more fan-shaped and things mm -hmm. like that. But the, the coloration and the, the patterning on it is just so beautiful. Yeah, I like that one. And it's got a pup under it, so yeah. I'll get to pull that out this year. Yeah, the nice thing about these guys is that they will pup at a very small size. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do in the spring is I take all the aloes and the hayworthias mm -hmm. and the gasterias, and I'll take them out and pot them up, mm -hmm. take all the pups off and pot them on for sale, and then just repot the main plant yep. and go on from there. Um, well, and, and you you showed us the baby aloe pharaxes. I think these are the less baby aloe pharaxes, right? I'm not sure, the pharaox. No, it's oh, Rolothii. No. Oh, wow, nice. It looks a lot like it, though, yeah. doesn't it? That's nice. Is that from last year? Yeah, that's from last year. So that's just one year old. Yeah, wow. And then that's that's the first first aloe pharaox that I ever grew, is oh, that one over there. Nice and meaty. Do you so, get pups off of that at all? Or not no? yet. Yeah. Not yet. 
almost like didn't even see, but like look at this milk bush. This I am beast. It's, it's huge. It's I have beast. one that's very tall, but this one's like nice and um, Well that's because I cut off of it out. so much. Yeah. Um and then here's another one that's blooming. That's pink butterflies. That's pink butterfly? Yep. Now can you grow this from seed or is it just offsets? I, I've never seen it produce seed. Yeah. I don't think Cal and Coe's ever produced seed. Yeah, okay. I think they always produce plantlets. Yeah. Um, but I already pulled all the plantlets that are over in that tray are from yeah. this plant. It's so funny because the, the, the leaves are green and yet the plantlets are pink. You know, because when they're small, even when they're small plants, they seem to have more pink, pinkish leaves. They do, and what I found is that as far as survival is concerned, yeah. it's the ones with the more green that are going to make it. So yeah. I'll plant all those plantlets, but very yeah. few of them are going to make it because they just don't have enough chlorophyll. Yeah. And so I'll plant all the plantlets and hope that you'll get a few plants. Because I think it's more, what's more decorative is having the little pink baby plantlets. Mm -hmm. So as the, if the plant itself can be nice and green and be able to support itself mm -hmm. and then have pink plantlets, mm -hmm. then you got a good saleable mm -hmm. plant. But if the plant itself is too pink, it won't thrive. Right. And you sell basically all of these. All of these are your mother plants, and you take cuttings off of them, and you're... For the most part. The some things, of course, are, like I said, just in the collection. Like, yeah. you know, like, like Lilacina. This is like <laughs> one of my favorite echeverias, but it does not propagate very easily. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take a whole bunch of leaves off of it every yeah. season and maybe get one or two plants for okay. it. So some of them just don't don't ever do much. Yeah. And I've got a lot of small, some of these small echeverias that I've grown that I've gotten from um, Mountain Crest mm -hmm. that just have never attained any size that makes them worth propagating. Mm -hmm. So I just keep them as part of the decorative. collection. The big, the, big, uh, the big echeverias that I propagate off a lot are in, actually in the house. And then you got some stuff that's not succulents down here and some, and your, some of your pots and planters and things, huh? Yeah, I try to put the lower light things down below. Yep. Um, and then some things that are on the floor are also more plants that are just trying to survive the winter. Yep. Um, it's much colder on the floor than anywhere else. Is that a ginger down there? Turmeric? It's a uh, cardamom. Oh, this one? Mm -hmm. Cardamom? Wow, that's cool. It's never bloomed, unfortunately. Yeah, but so you never get seeds. Huh? No. Very cool. Well, I, I love this. I love that you have, like taken your hobby to the next level, really? Because it's always been part of your, has it always been part of your sales? No. No. No, it it's really wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, I've always been, I've always been selling the herbs and tomatoes and peppers. Yeah. Um, and then it wasn't, like I said, until 2017 that I started oh, right, growing houseplants. Yeah. I mean, I was always growing them, but as far as um, selling them en masse. Yeah. Um, in fact, this year, I, I was I almost exclusively was selling them. I didn't have a lot of product this year because yeah. it was kind of a transitionally weird reality as far as uh, meat and egg production were concerned. Yeah. So I sold a lot more plants this year than usual. And it, it it really impresses me how much material I can get out of these plants mm -hmm. to produce more and mm -hmm. make it uh, without without buying in cuttings and without, yeah. you know, without buying in other plants and transplanting them on. I'm just, I'm just doing it for my own plants, which mm -hmm. is self-limiting, mm -hmm. but it also means that it's more economically viable for me because I'm not having to buy in propagation materials. Right. So um, it's well, a nice balance. Well, thank you so much for showing some of this. I, I think it's so cool and it's nice to see how you have this in the middle of a very rough winter. Rough winter. And it's nice and toasty in here. Um, there's a lot of ground heat coming in because there's so much gravel. How many feet of gravel is this, Mike, as long as you're here? Four feet, Four feet, feet of, of gravel. gravel. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's of course well drained, but yeah. also you're getting some you're getting some heat from the earth Soil as well. Gain. And we're getting gain from the house. Yep. Uh, from the wood stove, although most of the time the conservatory is heating the house. On a day like this, oh, yeah. the conservatory is heating the house. And I, that's the other reason why we made it so small, Right. was to really maximize the heat. Um, if I had a big sprawling house, it would be just like my big propagation house up there. Yeah. Like it would be too much to heat. So by packing everything in here, um, I, can, I can make the best use of the energy. What was your number one pest here? Scale. Scale, but what kind of scale? I have soft brown scale, and okay. I have the small citrus or the sister scale and the soft brown scale. So like the mealy bug is the I have mealy. Scale? I have yeah. mealy bugs as well. Um, some aphids, mm -hmm. some root mealy bugs. 
Um, so, but it's mostly mealybugs and scale. What do you do with the root mealybugs? How do you work root mealybugs are a real disaster? Yeah. If they're in a plant that you can't top. Yeah. I mean, if you've got root mealies uh, in an echeveria, yeah. that's not a problem. You just cut the rosette oh, off yeah. and restart it yeah. and toss this. Yeah. Um, if you've got root mealies in a plant that you can't easily do that to, then what I've done is I've removed it from the pot, get shake off and rinse off as much soil as possible, and then put the whole thing in very hot water. Mm -hmm. Not so hot that you're, I think it's like, 15 degrees something degrees to that effect yeah. yeah and I have tried that yeah. to varying degrees of success yeah. I, I have done that myself and I was like this did not work 115 degrees I had the thermometer right in there I was like no they just come back I'm like, I've also done I've also dipped the root mass in um, in alcohol okay. and isopropyl alcohol okay. and that's worked well as well yeah. but generally I will top plants and ditch the rest but the beauty of the propagation is that I can just when I'm propagating, I can easily clean small, you know, leaves or yeah. leaf cuttings or something like that. So whereas the mother plant might have more issues, I try not there to be any issues on anything that's going out the door. Well, thank you so much for this, sure. this, little, this little tour. I mean, I, we only saw just a, a little smidgen of your plants, but my golly, it's, uh, you got a lot in here. I'd like to shout out to Squarespace who is my sponsor for this video. Now all of my websites, including homesteadbrooklyn.com, houseplantmasterclass.com, and even my personal website over at summerrain.net are all built on Squarespace's platform. Now this is for obvious reasons. They are this all-in-one platform that offers up slick, modern designs that provide incredible user experience. Now you could customize their already primo templates, integrate your social media seamlessly, and even send out emails. And oh yeah, if you ever need help, their customer service is dope. So if you're interested in checking them out, you can use my link, squarespace.com slash summerrain for 10% off your purchase. Check out the link in the description below. And if you're seeking more information about gardening outdoors and homesteading in the country, then check out our new channel over at Flock Finger Lakes. See you there.